Okay, so last class we looked at, uh, we were working inside, I think, chapter 6, which actually dealt with programming. We went over the rules, uh, and I did hand those out to you, so they are not exactly the same as they're in the book. So make sure y'all use mine and not. Uh, talks about syncing and sourcing. Everybody okay there? Got any questions on that? Okay. Yeah. Only applies to DC, right? Showed you how to actually connect up to yours. Uh, talked about the basic instructions. Now, some of these uh, we are going to use this semester. Let's see, I think in this class we're going to go up through counters and timers. Yeah, we're going to have to learn about the scan, that's for sure. And this will, this will probably tell you why if we repeat, if we repeat IOs, and I might do this on par purpose if we have time, if we hit repeat output instructions. Then it's the last one in the scan, which basically is what, what it actually accepts. So basically, if you put four of them in there, three of them is not going to make any difference because the last one in the scan is what's going to accept it. What chapter you? What chapter you in? Oh no, we don't need to know that right now. We'll deal. We'll deal with uh, with uh, interrupts. So some of the things we'll deal with if you take, if you end up taking the PLC two class or the advanced PLCs, is we'll talk about interrupts. We'll talk about uh, math. We'll talk about compare instructions, uh, sequencers, uh, logic instructions. Uh, and here we're going to learn about logic, but we'll learn how to do basic logic with with relay with contacts so plc lat scans from instructions in the upper left hand corner ends with the lower left uh, lower right hand corner after last instruction the lower right hand corner scan restarts so uh that would be basically so don't worry i'll say what you mean now don't don't worry about that right there uh so this is basic this is basically a scan right here so what it does, it basically, and this is really fast, it reads your inputs. And what it does when it reads your inputs, it places it in memory in what we call an input data table. And then what it does, it processes that input data table. So your program doesn't, doesn't actually read the inputs. This is done automatically by, by the PLC. Uh, your program reads what's in the input data table. And then what it does, it runs your logic, and then after that, it outputs information to the output data table, and then that data table is transferred to the actual output ports themselves, if we use an output port. Uh, we're going to talk about a very, very important concept about uh, we, have, we have what we call internal relays that does not use an output, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So output energize, we'll use that instruction. So the symbol, uh, we'll use that for that. And I'll show you why you probably need to know the names of these instructions, especially when you get into advanced programming, instead of trying to use that uh, that thing at the top. So this is going to be two, looks like two parentheses. And then this will be what we call an output enable. And if we see this, that's what it would be abbreviated. So if you hover above it, if you take your mouse and just sit there a little while, it'll come up here and say OTE. And of course, it's up to you know that that means output enable. Then what we have is we have two latch instructions, output latch. And this would be, and we'll play around with these and we'll get in more detail with this. This would be that same symbol with an L in the center. And then we have an output unlatch would be that same symbol with a U in the center. And we're not going to get into one shot rising in this one, but this would be a block instruction. 
And what this is, this is an instruction uh, that examines the input every time it's scanned and updates it if it goes from a true to a false or a false to true. So if it's if it's out if it's if it's one shot rising, then if the input goes to from a false to a true, then it'll trigger the output for one scan. So that's why they called it a one shot, and then it'll automatically reset itself. And it could stay it could stay true from now to doomsday. And it could go false from now to do say, but it only goes true when it sees a what? It sees a false or true out uh, transition. But we're not going to deal with that. We'll deal with one shots in the in the in the in the advanced PLC class. And if you take if you take the uh, the ILT 212, which is where we actually uh, convert the 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 Festo line from Allen Bradley PLCs over the Siemens PLCs. We'll, we'll have to learn this too because one of the instructions they use in the program is that. In fact, I think the one I showed you the other day. Input scan. Processor reads input ports and updates the input status table. Program scan. Pro, uh, processor executes PLC program and updates the output uh, status table. Output status table values transferred to the output and then the thing just loops. So this thing just loops. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever until it sees that and unless you take it out of the program Unless you take it out of the run mode. So anytime the program is in a run mode and that's That's probably 99.9% .9 of the programs written for computers. They just loop so you're watching me run PowerPoint But what that program is doing right now is just doing what? It's just looping just looping just looping just looping unless I bring in another program or I tell it to stop so PLC programs do that, uh, but this is automatic. So when it sees that end instruction, that last rung down there, it automatically goes back up to, uh, which is rung zero, it automatically goes up to the top rung and repeats this over and over and over and over again when it's in the run mode. The only time it stops that is, of course, if power fails to the PLC or if you take it out of the run mode and put it into the program mode. As soon as you put it in the program mode, the run mode stops. And it's up, it, you can either uh, upload a new pro, download a new program into it, or you can upload a program back down into your computer. Uh, and, uh, but it's not running the program when you have it in program mode. That makes sense? Uh, input output uh, ME so we're not going to talk about this there's no time let's see this is a scan we looked at that uh, what we do is we come in here so let me uh, instead of me doing this we'll come up here and uh, this is one important thing we need to know is how the memory is allocated inside uh, the PLC or this PLC so what uh, RS Logic 500 did, and like I said, when when uh, the PLCs originally came out, we didn't have a lot of people that were really knowledgeable about computers. So what they tried to do is make it as easy as possible for novice to come in and set up a program without having to manage the memory in the in in the PLC. So when we come over here and uh, let's see if I uh, let's see if I got a program out here. So if you if you got a program stored on your disk, then if you want to create a new program, you go here. And once you click on that, what's the first thing it's going to ask you for? The model, yeah, the model of your of your PLC. That's the first time it's going to ask you for. So these are all programs. If you got extensions turned on, so most people don't do this, uh, but every file has what we call an extension. And basically what the extension, so you see the name up here, analog input, backup 18, dot RSS. Well, uh, this is the file name, and the extension identifies what program that file belongs to. So we have the ability with Windows to set up what we call file associations. Uh, file associations is when you, when you click on a, when you click on a program, it loads in the right application to run that program. So this identifies the programs. Most people turn this off. I like to leave it on. So if you ever looked at a program, a true program, it's going to have an EXE or a, a COM extension, which is a... Uh, so all of these are RSS, which makes it nice because if you know the extension, 
uh, if you go to file manager uh, you can come up in search and you can say asterisk makes all combinations and then you can say dot rss and then it will look for all the files with that extension so asterisk means all combinations so if y'all didn't know that so now I can come up here and I can search this computer to see if there's any of these files on here so uh, but you gotta know what you gotta know the extension if you have that turned off, you can't do what? You can't see them. So, okay. So we'll load. Let's see. AUT 208 cascade counters. We don't need that one. Decoders, decoders, demo. Uh, so I think this is the one we loaded in the other day. So that's the way you do it to come in and actually pick up a program. So you you start working on the program in class. Uh, you don't have time to finish it just save it right you understand so save right here click on that and then save it to your disk because if you click on this it's going to tell you do you want to exit without saving your program and if you say yes then what's going to happen no i won't go save it if you say if you say exit this without saving your program and you say yes then you you've you've lost it you've lost your program if you say no, it'll come back to this feature, but that shows the little, uh, that shows the little three, still showing the little uh, three and a half inch floppy disk, by the way, uh, which is very, very popular. Okay, so here's my program, and what we're looking at now is we're looking at this over the left. We call this the project tree. And these are the system files right here. System zero, which we... And most PLCs now don't don't address or don't show you the system files because you can't access them anyway. Because it's kind of, to me, it was kind of stupid to put something up there that you couldn't get into. Here are your programs right here. So our base program is what we call Ladder 2. And, you know, this shows File 2 down here, which is Ladder 2. Uh, by the way, uh, you can come in and you can right-click on this and you can rename this if you want to. Are we okay so far? Now, what we have the ability to do is that some, some programmers call this the main program or the main loop. What happens, and we're not going to do it this class, but we'll definitely do it in PLC, uh, if you take PLC2, is that when a program gets extremely involved, big, big, long code, a lot of code out there, it gets very, very complicated. It gets very, very complicated to go out there and find a certain section inside your code. So we call it structured programming, which means you take a big, long program and you divide it into sub-modules uh, that some people call subroutines. So what I have the ability to do is I can come up here on my program file and I can right click and it says new. And by default it gives it file three and then we can come up and give it a name. And then I say okay. Now right now I got two, prog two program files. I got the main file and then I've got the one I call rich. Could be a subroutine. Well, what we have to do is we have we have to tell it. So this is ladder one. So ladder one is the let me sorry ladder two is the main one. But what I have to do is I have to tell it from my main routine. I have to tell it when to run that. So one of our instructions out here, uh, if I insert this, and this is not for this class. I'm just showing you what 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 we can do. So if I come over here uh, under uh, oh wrong thing. If I come under here under I have to find where's that now. Input output compares logic. Let's see file miscellaneous. Oh program control then one of our programs is what we call uh, a jump to subroutine. And then what we'd go is we'd give it, we'd give it the file number. So this would be, uh, and we won't talk, we'll say like E3, and then that would cause it to go to that subroutine when it hit that. So what we normally do is we come up here and we, if we got a real long program, and y'all can imagine that, 
So if I went over there and looked at that robot program over there that run that's running the Amatro line, which some of y'all can't see because of the whiteboards, it is nothing. It starts off with a main loop and it just calls subroutines. And this was really neat because when we moved the when the guy came up here and set this thing up, the the line was originally over here. Well, the robot is sitting on the floor. It's not mounted to the line. It's sitting on the floor. So it's almost impossible to make a floor perfectly level. So when we moved the amateur line over to that side like that, the robot was missing its spots by about that much. So what I had to do is I had to reteach every every spot. Well, the pro but it was it was no big deal because it was set up in subroutines. So we had a subroutine called pick up block. And so I would run that subroutine and I could get it until I got the point right. So what's nice about subroutines is you can take a big log program take a section of program that does something, split it off what? By itself, and then it makes it so much easier to troubleshoot. So instead of looking for some code inside, you know, 200 lines of code, trying to find that, you say, okay, I want to do this. Well, you'll have a subroutine named, well, this does this, and you'd go in there and you can, you can troubleshoot real easy. What's that? No, subroutines are just when we take a section of the program and we divide it into modules to make it easier to troubleshoot and make it easier to maintain. A network would be where we come in and we connect the computers together. And then we have, we have special commands, which we won't get into this class, called get and put or something like that where we could get it from another PL, get information from another PLC or we could come in and actually set it up. Uh, it depends on the type of network you have. Uh, if it's a uh, if it's a DFI if it's a uh, if it's a DFI network, then you would have to set up what we call a master slave situation, where you have one master where you keep all your tables and then everybody accesses that. If it's Ethernet, uh, basically you, you don't have that situation unless you want it to be it. So you could you could literally go into any PLC on a ether, on an Ethernet network and get the input table off that. And then you could use that for things. So that's a good question. So subroutines is just like me dividing things up, right? And so it'd be like uh, I'm writing a book. So I could start to, so writing a book. So they could just start from start to finish and write the whole thing, but they usually don't do that. They split it up into what? Chapters. And then each chapter has a title. Now you can go into an index, and it says, well, this title is on page so-and-so. So that's what subroutines is. So try instead of write, trying to read the whole thing and find information, right, you understand that, and find that information, you, you can look at the chapter and it says, okay, chapter 6 deals with this. Can you imagine if they just took, took this whole book and didn't split it into chapters? And then we'd have to go. So I can say chapter 6, right? You, you can go to your index. You can say chapter 6, and you'll go up there, and you're, and you're with me. So that's basically what subroutines are, exactly the same thing. So we take a big, long program. Now, this program, I wouldn't do subroutines because it's small and easy, and I know exactly what it does. But if you go back and look at some of these programs, like the program running the Festo line over there, it's divided into subroutines, and I can actually I can actually sh show you all those. And so now, if the e stop doesn't work, I don't have to figure out what where the e stop is where in a program this long. I just go to the subroutine called em stop, and I can figure out what's going on there. So that's a really good question. So this is ladder. So this is where our programs will be. Ladder two is there by default. You can't do that. That's your m main program loop. So even if you're doing subroutines, you still have a main program loop. And I'll basically, if you ever look at these things, it just does subroutines, unless it has something that's going on. If you don't like it, you can just highlight it, come up here, and then we'll just delete it. Now, if you're on the 1000, if you're on the Micrologic 1000, uh, if you look at its project tree, it's got ladder two, and it's already got six or seven ladders out there. So. On the RS Logic 1000, you cannot add additional files. You cannot add additional program files. On the 1100, since it's not considered a fixed PLC, then you have the ability to set split it up until you run out of memory. So ladder two, very important. This is all we're going to be working with in this semester is ladder two. Uh, 
uh, if you don't want to call it ladder two, it's, you can come up here and rename it and call it, you know, what you want to. And then we hit enter, and all of a sudden now it's still, it's always going to be ladder two, but now it's got rich out beside it. And notice my tab changed to what? Can y'all see it down there? Changed to rich, yeah. Well, then we get into the true data files. Cross reference we're not interested in. Data file zero, this is where your outputs are. So if I come up here and click this, uh, this will show me the status of my outputs right now. So every one of them are turned off right now. And it puts, and the problem is though, it eats up 256 bytes of memory no matter how much inputs outputs you have. Are we okay? Uh, data file one, this is your input. This is where you can go and look at your input data table. Data file two, this is the status register, so this will show us the status of the PLC. Uh, it'll show us scan time, so we could actually bring this up and we can look and tell us the, the scan time is the amount of time it takes the PLC to make one cycle through the program. So we can actually see that. And sometimes that causes problems. We don't deal with it a lot anymore. Uh, but if you look at the uh, if you look at the instruction set for the 1100, it actually gives you the time it takes the PLC to execute each instruction. Uh, so scan time. And sometimes that's a lot of times we do because if you have a real long scan time, then it might actually miss it actually might miss inputs. So if, if an input changes and it's running the logic and it comes back and drops back before it resets, then we might miss an input. So, and we used to have that problem a, a long time ago when, uh, when the scan times on the process, when the processors wasn't as fast as they are now. Uh, binary, these are what we call B3 files. We'll use these a lot this semester. What this does, it allows us, so if I come over here, if I come over here and say O, oh, that's going to use up one of my output ports, my output bits. Yeah. Well, the problem is in in a control in a control situation, or in most control logics, like 90% of the of the program is decision making. It don't need to generate an output. It just needs to make a decision. So if I wanted to come in here and I wanted to just put a simple seal in circuit that I could use and I don't want to turn on out anything or off anything I'm gonna go back to my uh, main menu which is my user menu and then I'm gonna bring down and I'm gonna drag down another rung I'm gonna put it very top so you can put these things just about anywhere inside there you want to uh, I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna put two inputs I'm gonna put a down drop I'm going to drag this into that. So to drag it, don't pull it at the top because it's going to want you to put in an address. So you drag, just come down at the bottom down here, just right, just uh, click, uh, right, uh, left click, and just drag it to where you want to put it. Put one right here, and then I'll come over here and put this one. So I'm going to set up a simple memory circuit. So these are going to actually be these are actually going to be uh, push, uh, going to be um, switches. Input colon zero slash. I'm using zero. I'm using zero. Uh, that's for the heck of it. Just use. Uh, let's use four. I hit enter. Now, if you click away from it, it's not going to give you the option of entering a symbol, right? You understand that? But symbols are required. So, what do y'all do now? You said, oh, I messed up. I didn't give this a symbol. Right click it, yeah. Right click it, go down to here and say edit symbol. And now we can give it a symbol. So we'll call this uh, start, we'll call this stop. And then I'll come over here and enter this address. We'll call this uh, zero slash five. Oops, <laughs> zero slash five. The uh, address in for, uh, for segments is a little different. So sometimes I might make that mistake guys. Uh, and then, but if you hit enter, it's going to give you the option. It's by default, it's going to come into your comments. We're not going to use comments. You can hit tab or you can click on that. 
right, we'll call this start. Now what I'm going to do here is instead of using one of my outputs, I'm going to say B3, colon 0 slash 0. These are what we call internal coils, which means these work just like a coil, but they don't generate an output. So what it does, so I've only got six outputs to work here. And here I come in my program and I eat up one of my output addresses and I never use that output for anything. I don't hook a, I don't hook a light up to it. I don't hook a motor up to it. I don't hook up anything to it. Well, this is where we would use what we call these B3 files. So these are for internal relays. So we'll call this run. And of course, once I've got my, once I've got my symbol, I'm going to seal it in with the run. So I'm going to type in run and it automatically assigns. So these contacts are assigned to input ports. This contact is assigned to this internal coil. And of course, we'll check it for errors, and it says it doesn't have any syntax errors. Now, understand, <laughs> if you assign it the wrong address, but you do it in the right syntax, this guy right here is not going to find it. So just because you click on that does not mean there is no errors in the program. Uh, that's like running spell check, you know, spell check tells you a word is written wrong. I mean, misspelled. It don't mean, uh, of course, most of, it, most of them now, I use something called Grammarly, which is really cool, guys, because it not only checks your spelling, it also checks your entire syntax, which is pretty neat. So, uh, so this is what we use, so B3, so B3 would be this guy right here, B3. A T4 is for timers, so when we get into timers, we'll come in here and we'll look at these. Uh, so timers is right here, timers and counters right here. So if we wanted to put a timer, you know, in this system somewhere, we would just come in here and go back to user. Uh, I can, I'll put one in, let's see. Highlight, highlight the rung you want to deal with, so it won't let you drag anything down. Drag something down. Of course, I would get an error now. Want to pull this into here. Oops, Rich. Grab it at the bottom. Pull it into here. And then I would insert this thing called a timer. <laughs> and I had it blown up too big. By the way, so you'd have to trace this down. So I've got it, I've got it displayed real high. So this is actually what it looks like. And then it's going to ask me for certain things. But this would be a block instruction that we get into there. Okay, so if I try to check it now, it's going to tell me I got an error because it's going to tell me I didn't identify all this stuff over here. If you want to delete instruction, you just highlight it and do what? Hit the delete key. Oops. And it's gone. If you want to get rid of this down drop, just hide it, highlight it, hit delete. Um, but make sure it's red what you want to get rid of. So there's timers, counters. These are these are block instructions also. Uh, so uh, if we wanted to bring one of those into the program, uh, then we would have to enter additional information. So outputs. And by the way, notice when I did a timer. When I did a timer, uh, it started out with T4. So let's let's uh, I'm gonna break a rule. So here's a timer. So when I assign when I assign this timer, so this is breaking a rule. But when I have when I assign the timer, I have to start out with I have to start out with T4. Go ahead. Because I'm specified, and I'll show you why in a minute. So inputs and outputs, these are physical things. So when inputs and outputs, I don't have to specify the file number because they never move. Okay. They never move. But the problem is, is I'm saying, okay, I'm going to access the information in this file right here. Timers can move. Well, timers can't move, but let me, let me get rid of this. Let's say uh, I use up all my timers. Okay, I, I need more timers, and I've, used, I, I've, I've, I've got 256 timers in here, but I need more timers. 
Well, what I can do is I can come up here on my on my data file, and then I, I right click and I can say new, and it's automatically going to assign it to nine, and then I come I can come up here and I can say I need more timers, and I could call it timer two. Okay. So now I've got two timer files. I got this timer file. I got this timer file. Well, I, if I say timer, I got to specify which which file these this information is on. So all these we can't. The inputs and the outputs are physical. So the only thing I can do on this is I can add more physical switches. So on our inputs and outputs, we don't have to specify file one and file zero because it's understood. But since I can add more timers, can I? Since I can add more counters, can I, since I can add more status, since I can add more integers, then the instruction has got to, got to specify which data file that you're working in. So that's a really good question. So all your timers. So if I want to add to this B3, if I run out of B3s, what can I do? Well, I can come up here. I can right click on on the on the 1100s. By the way, the 1000s are fixed. When you get a fixed PLC, you get what you buy. But to make the programs compatible, then that means we still have to specify everything at the time. So I could come up here and I can add another B, B3 file, and then I can come back and say, okay, well, see, it automatically assigned it 10. So that means I've got to do what? I've got to specify these data files that we can add more of, then I've got to specify the number. So good question. If I don't want it, what can I do? Right click it, delete it, yeah. Are you sure? So I got right a 10. Let me get rid of my other timer. Okay. So your inputs and your outputs, these are physical. Your binary, your your other data files can move around, so you have to specify specify where where it's at. So outputs, inputs, binary, they, we call these B files or B B3 files. We're going to use these for more more than one thing. But in this class, we're going to use it for what we call internal internal coils. And what are these? Well, these are the coils that we use in our program, but they don't need to output to the outside world. And we call these B3s. Uh, so that's the data files. Now, some they didn't talk about in the book that we'll look at. The problem is integers. Uh, integers are numbers without a fraction. Now the problem is the problem is is that and they're 16-bit numbers, 16-bit integers, and we do have the ability with the 1100, by the way, to add something else. But an integer. So let's see if we can find this, and we'll explain this. So system systems we can't do anything with. Like I said, uh, these are not available to the RS Logic 500 users, so why they put them in the data and the in the project tree, I don't know. Uh, then ladder two, everybody okay on ladder two? That's the only one we'll be working with this semester. Uh, if you take the second PLC class, we'll deal with subroutines. Uh, subroutine files, we've already looked at that, right? Showed y'all a little bit about that. Uh, input outputs. Uh, now, what the book left off with is what we call floating point numbers and integers. It talked about integers pretty well, but it's kind of hard for the novice to understand. So, what we do, uh, so y'all know what an energy is. What, an e what is an integer? That is a number without a fraction. Some people call it a whole number. Well, the problem is, is in, in, in computers, we don't have symbols in computers. We have ones and zeros. So that means if I'm going to do a signed number, somehow I've got to represent the sign with a one or a zero. So what they decided to do was to, and we're not going to talk about two's complement, but this because you don't need to know that. What they decided to do is to sacrifice the most significant bit to represent the sign when I deal with integers. So we're dealing with a 16-bit number or a word. One, two, three. Well, if I sacrifice that one bit, that means I'm going to lose a lot of combinations. 
So if I've got, normally, if I've got 16 bits, uh, that'll be 2 to the 16th, which would equal the 65,536, which would give us the ability to represent, uh, 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 and that's counting from zero, right? You understand? Which gives us numbers. The biggest number we can, uh, the, the biggest number that has weight, we could do 65,535. But if we sacrifice one of the bits for the sign, that means we go from 65,536. We drop down to 2 to the 15th. Which would be 32,000. I should have that number. Somebody look on their chart and give me 2 to the 16th. 2 to the 15th, I'm sorry. Yeah. 768. So what that means is, is, and what they do is they say, okay, if I'm dealing with integers, signed integers, if there's a zero in the most significant bit, the number's positive. So zero is positive. And if I put a one, it means the number is what? Negative. Now the range of the numbers, the range of the numbers is I could have 32,768 negative numbers. And I can have 32,767 positive numbers. Can anybody tell me why? Why do I have one less positive number than I have negative numbers? Zero. That's exactly right. So zero would be assumed to be a positive number, but it's not. Zero has no sign. So when we start dealing with these sign numbers, uh, we lose. We have one more negative combination than we do have. We have po then we have positive numbers positive combinations because of zero. Good point. No, this is floating. Floating is floating is a, a, a number that uses exponents. So floating can be anything it can be large, large numbers. What we're doing with this, so these are basically numbers. These are not it so it's just like your calculator. If you exceed the range of your calculator so surely, I've got to have the ability to represent numbers in a manufacturing situation that would exceed these ranges right here. So what happens on your calculator when you exceed the range of your calculator? It automatically goes into scientific notation. That's floating point numbers. So floating point numbers uses scientific notation. Fix, yeah, these, these integers, these are not floating point numbers. So we're limited to the number of bits that we use. So on the on the eleven uh, hundreds, all we got is integers. On the one on the on the eleven oh, I'm sorry on the one thousands, all we have is sixteen bit integers, which means we're we're going to be limited to this range right here. On the eleven hundreds, uh, one of the files that that don't come by default, but we can set it up is called a long integer. A long integer gives us it's a it's a it's a thirty two bit number. So that's a lot. That's big numbers. We should satisfy that. So the the 1,000 doesn't support the L file, but the uh, the 1,100 does. So that's what it says. It says, okay, inputs. We're okay there, right? Examine if open. Examine if closed. Anybody get, got anything on that one? Yeah. Uh, we talked about this. The layout of an input or, or of an instruction. Uh, status registers, we know we can't do, we can read the status register, but we can't do anything with it, right? Everybody okay? okay. Uh, timers, T4s, holds information related to the number of timers used in the ladder diagram, depending on the size of the PLC RAM. There could be uh, timers with addresses from T4, so T4 to 255. So all these data, all these data files are set up for 255 entries. If you need more, you can add another one if you're on if you're not on a fixed PLC. On a sick on a fixed PLC like the 1000, you got to take that into consideration. You have to know a not a lot about your application uh, if you buy a fixed PLC. But what is the advantage of a fixed PLC? Huh? 
There's one advantage. It's cheaper, a lot cheaper. In fact, uh, one, uh, uh, Alan Bradley puts out one they call a programmable relay, <laughs> which is cool. But it's a PLC. It's just, it, 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 uh, it has a high power output. It can output like 8 amps. A PLC ladder diagram can, uh, can have uh, access to 256 timers. By the way, remember, when we're addressing, in numbers, zero means nothing. In addressing, zero means something, right? You understand that. A uh, number of timers may be limited due to the lack of enough RAM in the memory of the PLC. Each timer requires three words. By the way, this is the book uh, refers to this wrong. So the book incorrectly called these registers. Uh, registers are actually inside the microprocessor. If you look at the manuals, they do not use the term registers. They call these elements. So every timer you have, every timer you put in requires three words of memory. And you can have up to 250, from zero to 255. You can have 256 of them. But the book, anytime the book uses the term register, you need to replace that with element because you can look in the manuals from now to doomsday and you won't find that term. Are we okay? Counters holds information related to timers. We can have up to 255, but notice down at the bottom, uh, if I've got the right PLC, if I've got like 1100, then I can assign it, but uh, file numbers 9 to 255 may be available. So I showed y'all how to add more timers, right? On, on. Okay. And this is this is one of the problems that uh, that programmers realized that was going on with 500. 500 is a really nice operating system or application. It's really clean. It's been around for a while. But the problem is, is in here, the PLC manages the memory. So that means I have no option. If I set up a timer file, if I set up a timer file, then it's going to eat up 256 words of memory. Now, times three for every one that I set up. So it sure would be nice is that if I only, it only uses the memory for what I need. Do y'all you, do you understand that? So the big difference between between this guy and newer PLCs is uh, the newer PLCs and the newer programming applications like 5000 and uh, and TIA Portal, the memory is is how you set it up. So if you want a timer, you put a timer in there and it eats up the memory for a timer. But on 500, since they wanted to make this easier for people that did not understand computers, they, the PLC manages the memory, or the application manages the memory. So if I set up another timer file, then basically I'm dedicating another 256 times 3 uh, for, for counters and timers. But it makes it easier for us to explain and, and understand the memory. Uh, counters holds uh, related to counters. And it says data files 9 through 255 may be available uh, for counters on some Allen Bradley PLCs. And I showed you how you could add another data file out there, right? Uh, control registers, this is 256 used to control registers. Control registers can hold valuable information related to sequencers and shift register instructions. Uh, we, that's something we'll get into if you take advanced PLCs. Sequencers are really cool. Sequencers is, uh, if you had a, a complex operation, uh, you could actually set up a sequence that you wanted the outputs to respond. So here you might want to turn output on, input, and output, output one, two, three, four, and then you could shift down and, and turn on a whole another set. And we call those sequencers, which is really powerful. Uh, integers, so here we go, here's our numbers. And this is where we came up with those numbers. Those 256 words that can be used as temporary storage integers, sign numbers between 32,767 plus 32,767 and 32, minus uh, 32,768 uh, are available to us. 
And where this is going to come into play, guys, is when we get to counters. Because we can make counters count up, and we can make counters count down. If I'm counting down, and I go past zero, then it's automatically, so counters use integer, uh, integer numbers. Timers use integers, too. Uh, the 1100 supports a L for long word. The 1000 doesn't do this. And this is a 32-bit number. So if I'm on a 1000 and I need numbers greater than 32,000, uh, integers greater than 32,768, then I can add an L, I can add an L data file. So if I go back up here and, and uh, let's see, if I go back to 5,000, come over here, notice this is the 1,000, so I go L and I, I go new. And then one of my options down here is long. And this would be an L, L register, I mean data file. So this is not available on the 1,000, but these L, this L data file is available, but you have to add it. This is a 32-bit binary number. Uh, the book doesn't cover this, and it doesn't cover floating point either, so we need to do that. So now I have an L, and it jumped down to 9 because that's the next data file available. So now I could, use a, I could set up a counter that could count between these ranges right here. Uh, plus 2,147,400. I mean, two billion one hundred forty-seven million four hundred eighty-three thousand six hundred forty-seven plus. And the minus is the same. We have one more minus than we do plus because the mi because zero eats up one of your plus combinations. So this is supported by the one thousand, but we won't be need we won't need numbers that big in this class. <laughs> uh, new PLC support this. Uh, if you take uh, if you take the PLC three. Uh, we'll specify, tell you how we can specify uh, the, the uh, I have to go back and look at 5,000, but, uh, but uh, the TIA portal supports double long, double long words and long words. So this is it. The long word data file is available on some PLCs, but, but we have to do what? It has to be added. It didn't come as default. So we'd have to add that data file. Floating point, book doesn't do a, do a good job on this. Floating points, these are 32-bit long word or long words, but what they do is they split it up into a exponent, a matiza, which is the number on the bottom, right? An exponent, and so what we can do with this is automatically we can represent numbers, sign numbers from uh, <laughs> 3.4028 times 10 to the 38th and minus times 10 to the 38th. Uh, it looks, uh, and they can be the same, by the way, because we're here. We're not sacrificing a bit that holds weight. We're sacrificing a bit that in, indicates sign. So these are floating point numbers. So these would be numbers that that are fractions. So if you got a number that has fractions, by the way, as long as you don't exceed 22 bits. It will not shift into scientific notation. As soon as you exceed these in your in your bottom number or your base, as soon as you exceed these, then this is where it shifts into scientific notation. So we can use this for for numbers. Uh, this will this will definitely come into play here. We're going to deal with nothing but but uh, integers. Uh, but you know. Uh, in PLC2, we're going to start talking about doing math, and division is where this really comes into play. Because division, a lot of times, you end up with answers that are fractions, right? You understand? So right now, with integers, we cannot do fractions. So if we're going to do fractions, we'll have to do it with floating point numbers. So anything that we do with our PLC that may result in a fraction, then we would have to use the F uh, data file. By default, it's called F8. But if we need more of them, we can add them on some of our PLCs. Okay, so that's floating point numbers. These are just like your calculator. So.
So as long as you're within the range of your calculator, so your calculator uses floating point numbers. Technically, most of your PLCs don't call them floating point numbers. They call them real numbers. So if you're programming another PLC and it, 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 it tells you how to identify real numbers, that's what it is. So as long as you don't exceed its range, it's going to give you the number, even with the fraction. As soon as you exceed that range, it's going to automatically shift into scientific notation. So what's the problem with scientific notation? Well, the problem with scientific notation is that it has to round. So as soon as you shift into scientific notation, it means your answer is not as accurate as you may need it. And there's really nothing you can do about it. Uh, when the uh, Pentium processor first came out, uh, they the, they had a problem with their scientific notation, so it, it would give wrong answers on some of the things. And they uh, contacted of all these engineers contacted Intel and said, "Well, you know, this thing is not doing." And they sent them the program, they showed them the answers, and Intel said, "Well, if you send us your microprocessor back, they agreed with them. If you send us your microprocessor back, uh, we will send you a new one." And, of course, people said, well, what am I going to do with my, my, my computer without the microprocessor in there? And they complained about it. So uh, they actually said, well, just tell us you need one, and we'll send you a new one. So uh, that was an interesting story. So it's up to the programmer uh, in this firmware to figure how this works, by the way. So. Uh, B3 files, we're going to use these a lot. So B3s right now, we're going to use these for a coil that does not need to control something outside of the PLC. And like I said, in most, P, in, most uh, in, in big complex control systems, 90% of the, of the logic does not require an output. So if you assign it to an output, this guy here's only got six, then you've wasted an output that you don't have anything connected to. Used for I.O. bid instructions, N well, not input, uh, not true inputs. We can use them for contact. So that right there is a that is an input instruction. When you do that, as soon as you say I, that means that's an input instruction. If you come over and do this, and then you assign it to something inside your control con inside your control program then it's nothing but a contact being controlled by something. So basically, uh, we'll use the B3 for, for coals in this class. And of course, we'll start it off B3. And then we'll give it a symbol. And then we could use the same one for the contact that's controlled by that one. Everybody OK? So uh, the last thing, let's see, what else is this? We need to go to lab. OK, we're OK. So uh, the biggest problem we have, uh, probably one of the most used circuits in, oh, I, wrong thing, guys. Let me break up my program. One of the most used drawings in PLCs or circuits is this guy right here. People call it a memory circuit. People call it a ceiling circuit. And what it does, it allows us to use push buttons instead of switches. So if you can see what way this thing works, this right here has to be closed. So I'm using an examine if closed instruction. Okay, so let's download this. So how do I download it? Right here, right? Choose download. Since I've played around with this program before, it's going to give me the ability to assign it a revision number, which is a good idea. Uh, that way, if you assign them revision numbers, it'll give it the same name, but it'll give it a different revision of this. Then it's going to come up here and I haven't turned mine off, so we should be okay. 
Well, if you turn your if you turn your PLC off, uh, these are a little harder to do because you have to unplug them. Uh, by the way, normally when we call a PLC, we call first of all we talk about what powers it, and then after that, what we do is we so it, it found it. So then after that, what we do is we talk about how do we power the inputs. And then the third thing we do is how we power the outputs. So I would refer to this as an AC, because we power it up on AC. So you can see this power cord coming in on the bottom. Then we'd say DC. So this guy here runs DC inputs. And then we would say this guy here runs relay outputs. So we'd say this is an AC DC relay. So when you output these on these, you can actually hear the PLC click a little bit. And that's what that is, is the little relay inside there switching. Now, what's the advantage of a relay output? We talked about that in class. Like voltage Could be. But, the, but activating the voltage, the voltage don't matter. So I could actually hook, I could act, on my commons, I could hook up AC on them. I could hook up DC on them. I could hook up 120 volts DC. I could hook up 24 volts DC. So what's nice about relay outputs is that you de you determine what you do with it. Can you, do you, you can make them syncing. You can make them sourcing because they're relays. They're nothing but contacts. Uh, the biggest problem we have with relay outputs is the speed that they can switch. So they can't switch real fast. And plus they're electromechanical devices which means they could fail two different ways. So in the old days, it wasn't that important, but now we're dealing with uh, variable speed drives that are controlled with uh, what we call pulse width modulation, uh, and those are very, very high frequency outputs. So if you're going to deal with those guys, then you need to get, you need to get some type of solid state output. Okay, so here we go. So the Siemens we have here, it's actually written on here. <coughs> this one you have to read it. Your Siemens PLCs, it's actually written on the PLC, if I can get it to zoom in. So if y'all can read that, it says DC, DC, DC. So what does that mean? Huh? DC, DC, DC. Means we power it with DC. So we have a place we hook up power uh, down here. Oops, yeah, right here. So this is where we'd bring our power supply at. DC means we're using DC inputs and DC outputs on this PLC right here. So, so I downloaded it, and it asked me, do it. I would, by the way, if it don't switch into run mode, sometimes it don't do that for odd reasons. Uh, but what you do is you come up here and look at this. It'll, if it's blue, it means it's still in program mode which means you can't run it, right? You understand that? And since we've got our set up for remote, uh, if it's blue, then you just need to click on this and just go back on to run. And now the PLC is in run mode. It automatically, or it asked me, did I want to go online? And I did. Okay. Oh, I'm using switch four, sorry. So switch four. Okay, so we're using an examinative close because the push button, uh, stop button has to be a normally closed push button. So people get this for thinking it, they get this backwards, right? Examinative close, so that means it's true if it's closed and the stop button is closed. And what's it waiting on now? Well, let's add a little more to it. So let's, uh, let's go, by, by the way, anytime I can come up here, I can go offline. If I want to change the program, I can come up here. You can't change it online, but you can change it offline. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to my user contacts. I'm going to highlight this rung. Uh, I'm going to drag a contact here. Oops, wrong thing, Rich. I'm going to drag a contact, put it right here, and then I'll assign this contact to run. Since I gave it a symbol, it automatically filled in the address information for me. So I'll assign this revision C. So 
Switch it back to run mode. Should ask me if I want to go online. Oops. And go online. So when we go online, it's really what it's really online monitor, which means you're actually being able to see what's going on here. So this guy here does not generate an output because it's an internal coil. Uh, my, my stop button is true because I've got it closed over here. I'm going to go over here and just touch my run. So I use my momentary contact and this guy here is sealed in and now this contact down here is true. So in your online mode, your two, your two power rails L1 and L2 should turn green. So green on this is showing you where it, what it's getting through. Yeah, it's either true, we, energized or true or false. It means this is, we would say this is energized. While we'd over here, we'd probably say this is true. Yeah. But, if you look at the PLC, the PLC usually has an indicator on what mode it's on. So my PLC says it's in the run mode. So what can I do? Well, I can come up here and I can disconnect my cable from the PLC. And this thing is still going to do. Now, I can't monitor it over here anymore. But the PLC is still running my program, right? You understand that? Can't go online because I've disconnected. So this is what I wanted to show you is that the PLC does not have to have the computer connected up to it for it to run. Uh, that would be awful if you went out there to every PLC on your manufacturing line and it had a computer out there. So once you've got it, once you've downloaded your program and you switched it to run mode, you can disconnect your computer. You could go to another PLC or whatever. Okay, anything else in the PowerPoints? We need to we need to go to lab. Counters. Integers, data files, floating point, V3s. Everybody okay with program run and remote? You got any questions on those? Offline, online, and online monitor. And so, basically, on this PLC, I should get rid of this. And I should, well, no, I should get rid of this. So it automatically, it, when it says, "Do you want to go online?" This is the actual mode that it's switching to. So that's right. Uh, download and troubleshoot PLC programs in the run mode. So we saw what this really helps us. By the way, we got three things. We got two things that it enfor enforces us. You can't see it on this one because this uses an LCD screen. I'll see if I can come in and uh, bring this up. They tried something new with this, and it was real, real hard to, to read. So uh, they've gone back to the light emitting diodes because they're real easy to read. But this was a try. So what I've got is I've got, uh, I'm going to come up here on this PLC. By default, it comes up to this. Uh, but I'm going to select IO status. And this right here shows me my input. So when I come over and flip that switch, you can see this turns on. So what I've done, I've just checked out without even putting out a meter. I've just checked out. I've just checked out. My sensor is OK, so I trip a sensor. And I'm seeing that it's made it to the PLC. And y'all can't see it, but here, this this is saying uh, output uh, output one is turning on. If y'all can see it, I know it's got a lot of reflection, guys. I don't know what I could do. Uh, on your on your one thousands, I so y'all can see it pretty good now. So this means this output is turned on, and then this input is uh, is true. So your PLC can help you do a lot of troubleshooting without getting out a meter. If you worked on electrical controls or motor controls, you, you use meters all the time. 
Uh, here, though, we can help the treat. The PLC can actually help us a little bit. So if I had somebody out there uh, tripping that sensor, and then this right here was going to a one every time they did it, then that would tell me that my wiring is good all the way from that device all the way to the PLC. And then my output is not generated, then we would know it might be something going on with our program. If this output right here goes, turns on, and then the motor doesn't come on, then that's telling me that we might have a problem with our wiring, and we might have to use a meter after that. So uh, this guy, uh, PLCs, has really uh, trimmed down what we have to we used to have to do to troubleshoot a circuit. So we talked about this, right? What are y'all gonna do when y'all get to these in your lab? You're gonna do what? You can mark off that. It's going to turn into a watt, common, and then you're going to put what you have. So notice your, your input devices, you have to use the electrical symbols. Uh, so this is a normally close push button. I was trying to see if he put the program in there. I hope he didn't because he... Uh, uh, then I would have to come up here, and you don't have to erase this. I would draw the way we're doing, and I would draw our, our power source. So all our, both these PLCs are running syncing inputs, which means the uh, which means the minus has to point toward the common on the PLC, and then the plus, which means the devices themselves, is what we call sourcing. And then on the on the 1100s, the MicroLogic 1100s. 1100s are edge. Uh, then it's using sourcing output, so we'll need to point our DC supply with a plus toward the output. Are we okay? Uh, on the 1000s, on the MicroLogic 1000s, these guys are using AC outputs. Well, they're, they're relay outputs, but they're wired for AC. Uh, so the symbol you would use is you use the symbol for an AC voltage source, which is a circle, kind of like the relay coil, but then it's got this little squiggly line in it. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do this for just about every program. You're going to have to, you're not going to wire the PLC up, but you're going to draw the way it would be wired up. So what type of contact in my program would I use for that guy right there? Would I use this contact or would I use, so let's say A, or would I use this contact, B? We got one B. And this is probably people, the problem is, do I want my program to be true when this is closed, or I want it to be true when it's open? When it's closed. So I would use this guy right here. This is an examine if closed instruction. So that means it's true when it's closed. This book, this guy makes this mistake all the time. He'll draw a normally closed push button, and then he'll use an examine if open instruction in his thing. So you got to be real careful with that. and. And I've written books before, and I understand the little mistakes you can make, uh, you know, uh, but uh, he does that all the time. And it was a he, by the way. So, yeah, if I want it, if I'm using, normally if I'm using a normally closed push button, now we have no problem, we have no problem on the one, on the 1100s, because our switches has two positions, well, actually three positions on it. So it's got a, on the 1100s, so the switches, we have, we have the center position, which is off. We have the left position, which means it's on all the time. So this is the way I would simulate a normally closed push button. And then if we push it to the right, this is momentary contact. So this is the way we would simulate a, a momentary contact push button. On the 1100s, on the 1000s, excuse me, so some of y'all have these.
So on the 1000, we have six lights, and, and uh, th so these are connected to outputs. Uh, three of them's red, three of them's yellow. So it says turn the green light on. You don't have a green light, so you'll come in here and you'll just use these and we'll call it green light. Uh, these are push buttons. We have five push buttons. These are momentary contact, normally open. So if it calls for a normally closed push button, the only option you got is to move over to your selector switches. So this is input zero. This is hooked up to input zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, we won't ever use nine, but most people use this guy right here. So this is, we're going to use this for a normally closed push button. So that way I can put it over here and it's closed all the time. And then I can just move it like that to click it. So everybody okay there? So that's the way you can do normally closed, normally open push buttons on each one of these trainers. So if the diagram calls for a normally open, normally closed push button, you cannot use one of these. You're going to have to do what? You're going to have to use one of these if the diagram calls for it. No matter, and you can reassign addresses. Sometimes the, the lab book gives you addresses. Uh, if you if it calls for a normally close and it says okay you're supposed to use input three and it's normally closed, well you just mark it out on the lab and say I'm going to use I'm going to use five right? Does that make sense? So yeah, it's up to you which one of these signs. So don't blindly follow those labs uh, because I'll come up here and I'll say well this is the wrong thing. Your your the the diagram shows me a normally closed and I, so which means I need to use an examine if closed and you're using an examine if open. So that only comes into play guys when you're dealing with inputs. After that they're normally open normally closed contacts. If they're inside the logic and they're assigned to an output, it's no big deal. It's only we got to consider that if I'm, a, I'm a, if I'm assigning that to an input instruction. And I think that's it. We took, looked at this offline, online, and we don't. Do, we'll we'll come back and look at force before y'all do that lab. So any questions so far? A lot of stuff. Okay, guys, so let's go back and uh, let's, uh, so what lab are we ready to do? I don't have my lab book here. In fact, the two lab books I have, these are all tore out on it. What is your first programming lab? 6-2. By the way, this lab book, there's a, there's a neat application out there. It's called, it's called Logic Pro. Uh, cost about $50. It simulates, it simulates the RS Logic 500. It uses an interpreter instead of a compiler. You see my Logic Pro thing right here? So you can get a licensed version. Originally, when they came out with the, the textbook, uh, they gave you a copy of this with your textbook. But the way it was keyed was that you had to have the CD in the computer for it to run. Uh, they've done away with that. Uh, the problem we have is the lab book still covers both of these. So if you look, you have two labs back to back. One of them's going to be RS Logic 500, and the one right next to it's going to say Logic Pro. They are exactly the same labs. It's just that, I, and why he did this, I don't know. Uh, I guess to make the lab book bigger. So this is Logic Pro. Don't it look a lot? Don't it look like uh, a lot like the original thing? But the problem is, is that, and we would do the same thing. Uh, the pro what, what we need to do, though, is we have these simulations, so we can come over here, and we can literally simulate input. So this would be just like the switches on the trainer. Uh, so I could come up here, and I could highlight this rung. I could pull down. So it's very similar. There is some, uh, there is some problems, but... Uh, So I could come up here and I could pull down an input, pull down an input ridge, and then I could assign it to. Now this is a mo this is simulating a modular PLC, 
So you notice the first module is input. So our starts on zeros, theirs is at one. Uh, so I'd have to say input colon uh, one slash zero. And then of course, and then we have three options on this. We can make it a, we can make it a normally closed. We can make it a limit switch, and then we can uh, make it a normally open limit switch, normally closed limit switch, and then a push button. And then this is your outputs. Oh, I'm sorry. This is put out by a company called the Learning Pit. You cannot download it to a PLC. You cannot not upload it from a PLC. This runs what we call an interpreter, uh, but it's nice to play around with. Uh, for a while, uh, Rockwell was offering a free version for RS Logic 500. And whether they're still doing that, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but you might check on that. But. Uh, if you wanted to do something like this at home. So this is 40 bucks. I mean, I'm sorry, it's 50 bucks. And that's for a lifetime license. Uh, they give you updates for five years. But uh, mine had updated since I've had it. So I guess they're popular with it. So when the book talks about Logic Pro, this is what they're talking about. We're not going to do any of those labs. We're going to skip over them. So if you look at the numbers, uh, that's why they don't usually go in sequence. If you want to, but you can keep you can keep those because they're the same labs. It's just that they're written for the Logic Pro software. It's what you, the ones you're going to tear out and turn in are the ones that, that that's specified in the in the write up. Okay, so let's go ahead.